Hello everyone and a big welcome back to you all. As horse owners know, one of the biggest responsibilities they have is making their horse's health their top priority. This includes everything from their feed, exercise, and routine visits from their primary supervising health care giver, their veterinarian. Veterinarians are the support system and in some cases the lifeline to a horse's longevity, ability to compete in the ring, and most importantly, to living a healthy and vibrant life. In most cases, vets' visits with the vet are routine, but there is always the other side of the coin that we all wish never had to happen. In those moments that are heart in your throat, gut-wrenching moments, we then rely on not only their expert knowledge, but also their compassion and understanding of the love and relationship we have with our horses. Today, I am fortunate to have with me Dr. Mike Pownell of McKee Pownell Equine Services. With an education in communication studies and biological sciences and working as a farrier for seven years, Mike then graduated with a doctorate of veterinary medicine from the University of Guelph in 2001. In 2002, Mike and his wife, Dr. Melissa McKee, started up the McKee Pownell Equine Services. Um, and this veterinary practice has developed into a multi location business with 14 vets and 30 support staff servicing all. Uh, horse breeds and disciplines. In 2015, Mike completed an executive MBA at the Ivy School of Business at Western University in London, Ontario. And with this added education, Mike then went on to partner in and develop Oculus Insights, which provides veterinary business consulting that assists equine veterinarians across North America, the EU, and Australia. Along with Mike's business portfolio, he is also very involved in the equestrian community with his long list of volunteer activities, most notably and most recently with the Ontario Equestrian for the Herd Fund Allocation Committee. This assisted in providing help for schooling horses affected during the pandemic. Welcome, Mike, and thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to sit and talk with me today. It is my absolute pleasure, Tracy. Thanks for having me. Well, this is great. It's uh, we were just chatting before we press record. It's been a while since we've seen each it other. It has been. It has been. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get started. What is the best descriptor for Mike Pownell? Is it driven, inspired, compassionate, or is it something else? I, you know, it really, I don't want to be flippant. It depends on the day and time of the day. Sometimes I think uh, if I was going to describe, I mean, driven for sure, curious. Um, I think in terms of what we do with McKee Pownell, like our, our, our purpose, why we do what we do is to ensure horse owners have peace of mind in the healthcare decisions. I hate, um, I hate injustices. I hate when people feel left out. Uh, and I think that's what drives me more than anything. I think you mentioned before my background was in communication. You know, I started all this. I was a, in theater and filmmaking and all that. I, I love connecting and I love making sure that people are grasp what's going on. You know, when you're dealing with the health of the horse, and as you said in the introduction, you have, you know, routine vaccines and dentistries, that's wonderful. But then you're on the farm at 11 at night, and you have a horse in real distress. And you've got to make some really painful decisions. Um, and knowing that the horse owner, you know, depending on whatever the decision could be, uh, is confident that that is what's best. And I think that's what drives me more than anything. And I think that drives me in terms of how we've created our business, really, a, we, you know, we really have a focus on taking care of people in our business, taking care of our employees. Uh, and, you know, we really have a people first kind of business. And so I think that's what drives me. Nice. And, and I know, when you and I first met years ago, you know, as you know, the registered equine massage therapy, so we were, we had mutual clients and, and, and I know that, I was really grateful for your ability to, to communicate and, you know, include me in the treatments that were going on and, and, you know, asking me, Hey, did you want to come and watch this? Did you, did you have any questions? And so from a person who works on that healthcare team, you know, having that ability to, to know that I could come to you with questions about, you know, a certain treatment plan or whatever, it was very, um, 
um, sat, like satisfying to me. I felt like I was supported with your knowledge and input, and and I was very comfortable in approaching you. Well, well, thank thank you very much. I remember those days, and it's like, I mean, we are a team, and you, one part of the team can't do everything. And you know, one of the things that frustrates us the most is not everybody wants to be a team player, and who suffers of it is the horse, the horse owner. Uh, but when you have somebody like yourself, who's like, all right, let's get in this together. Let's leave egos at the door. Uh, let's do what's best for the horse and, and what the rider want. That's the best. Yeah. You know, I think as you, as you alluded to in the intro, I was, you know, I was a professional farrier, full-time farrier for seven years before I, I became a vet. And that influenced me a lot in terms of, cause I was in positions where vets didn't want to talk to the farrier. And I knew I had some insights and I just felt like, you know, if we, if the two of us were just talking, we could do a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's leave the ego at the door and let's do what's best for the horse. Yeah. And, and I can honestly say too, that anytime there is a vet from McKee Pownell at a barn where I am working um, and, you know, and we have mutual clients, it's definitely that team effort and uh, they're, they're wonderful that way. So, yeah. Good. That's good to hear. Awesome. So as a leader in your field, what are your thoughts on the mental stress and state of being overworked that many equine vets are experiencing right now? Given the mental health crisis, a lot of vets seem to be dealing with, should there be more of an emphasis on self-care? Oh, absolutely. And you know, there's a lot going into this. So prior to the pandemic, this is a really stat, really sad statistic. Veterinarians, not just equine, but veterinarians yeah. across the world have the highest rate of suicide of any profession. Yeah. And that's a lot of research that came out. And this is in Australia, North America, Europe. You know, we have the enviable position of being a leader in something. Um, nobody really knows what the factors are. Um, you know, a lot of it, uh, I would think, because I've done some research with veterinarians of my side gig is um, since the advent of social media, uh, people go online and are, you know, there's less boundaries, there's less barriers, people can say what they want. And, and so, you know, a, a vet can give everything of themselves to a patient and have tried to do the best thing. And then all of a sudden, a thread starts online about how the vet did this or did that or was just in it for the money, blah, 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 blah. And it's just devastating. It's just devastating. So I think there's a lot of compassion fatigue too, as, mm -hmm. as veterinarians, we're the only medical profession that, you know, routinely euthanizes their patients. And so when you've had relationships with people, when you've had horses for 30 years, and you're the vet that, you know, help full it out, and you're the one putting it down, and, and you know, that has the impact. Yeah. Since the pandemic, it's gotten worse and now it, it's gotten so bad that um in the veterinary profession again globally there is an extreme shortage of veterinarians uh, and there's even more of a shortage in equine practice so it used to be prior to the pandemic maybe two to three percent of students graduating from an american veterinary medical association accredited college like ontario veterinary colleges would go into equine so that's not a lot. That's maybe 150 a year. Now we're almost at 1%. And so we're not even replacing the vets that retire. We can't even account for the growth of the professional industry. So in all of North America, maybe 50 vets or maybe 50 students want to go into equine practice. And just to make it even worse, 50% uh, of those will leave the profession in five years. So we are really in a crisis in the equine profession and, um, you know, people are starting to wake up within the profession going, what's going on wrong? And a lot of it was, well, we're not graduating the right kind of students. I don't think that's true. Um, I think a lot of it when they survey people is the, the hours, uh, for sure. It's a dangerous profession. Um, as anybody who's involved in horses knows, it's very dangerous. Um, the pay is, is not uh, comparable to what a companion animal that get typically. And so you're working more hours in a more dangerous position. Uh, you're doing a lot of on call and, um, your colleagues or your classmates from vet school are working fewer hours, making more money in a safer environment. And so a lot of them are like, this is why, and, and this goes back to when I say we have a people focused business is, um, 
when we started the practice, uh, Melissa and I, you know, like 20 years ago, we realized even then, regardless of gender or age or whatever, people didn't want to do the typical 24 seven that was associated with an equine vet. That was the thing of the past. And, and people wanted to work like other professionals and have weekends off and have nights off. And the, you know, that being a martyr to a profession wasn't going to happen regardless of the species. So that's one of the reasons why McKee panel got so big so quickly or purposely is the more vets we have working for us, the more on call we can share, the more people can have a life outside of what they do. And I think that's why we purposely have tried to develop it. So one of the things we really work on with our vets, and you're starting to see this more and more and in, in across the world of equine vets is that emphasis on self care of not working the heroic hours, taking the time off, um, and realizing that it's not sustainable how we do things. Yeah. Yeah. In the area that I'm in, um, you know, I, I work closely with a couple of vets and they, there's probably four because one recently retired and, you know, talking to this one vet, they said that they and the other vets were kind of chatting and they realized that if one of them retired, that our entire area is going to be at risk because yep. who is left can't handle it all. And it's, um, yep. it's quite scary and nothing saying anything about cattle vets, but I've, I've had clients that have had to call on a local vets where, you know, a cattle vet has to come out and just kind of tend to whether it's the, the basics or what. And it's just like, whoo, this is actually happening. Yep. Uh, you wouldn't want me to go to a, to deal with a cow with bloat. So I get it. Yeah. You know, we're good at what we do. And uh, there's a reason yeah. why we bring our cats to a small animal vet for spays and neuters and, and general care, because we're not small animal vets. So right. it is a problem. And, it, and it's, it, it's a, it's an industry wide problem because it's not just an equine, it's companion animal. It's everywhere. So yeah. um, the globe and mail had an article on this in the fall of 2021 and the shortage is so severe in Canada, they say it's going to persist till 2040. Whoa. So we're talking 18 years yeah. because of increased pet ownership and declining numbers of people going into the profession in general. Oh my goodness. So, so what kind of, uh, like, what kind of mental health self-care, like, do you, does McKee Pound now offer your staff this or like is in your other involvements, is this a topic that you're always trying to help promote and educate people on? Yeah, absolutely. So first thing we started to do, and I, I discovered this when I graduated from my MBA, I was reading an article on in a business magazine on employee engagement survey or just employee engagement. And they were talking about it in regards to large corporations. And I was like, you know what, this applies to a small business like ours as well. So we, we uh, did that. We did the survey in uh, the spring of 2016. And, you know, it, it gave us some insights into what was going on with not necessarily our veterinarians, but our support staff, what have you. And what we realized is that our vets were on the verge of burning out. And as I said, when there's fewer people coming into it, you want to protect who you have. Um, and that's when we changed to the four day work week for our vets, oh. because, you know, it was like, all right, they, it's a break. It's, and it's with on the on call, uh, with um, client communication, just the demands of the jobs. By the time we get to June after our, you know, our busy season starts mid-March and goes till the end of June, uh, but it sort of, you know, carries on to the Royal, um, you know, but by June, everybody's had enough mm -hmm. and we're like, that's just not good. Like, and so that's when we went to the four day work week <clears throat> and right away, we saw the next year that the scores went up, the vets were a lot happier. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were able to satisfy our, our client needs because they're just, they're more engaged. And I started getting emails from our vets saying, I'm enjoying being a vet again. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually able to read journal articles. I have time to read journal articles and actually be a better vet. Um, and so what happened is I think our vets were like, when they're on their four days, they're on and they're giving their all, but they know they have an extra day to, to, uh, 
you know, just to take care of themselves. Yeah. We offer uh, coaching, professional uh, executive coaching. That's what's typically called executive coaching, but we get, we offer coaching to all of them. You know, we all get into this stuck. We all get into a problem. And so by having access to a coach that we pay for, it helps people realize there's alternatives to the path that they're going on. Um, we allow people that, you know, you know, extended time off and slower time of year. So one of our vets um, at our, one of our locations said, I have an opportunity to go to New Zealand for the winter and sort of like a, you know, a working holiday. And I was like, you know what? We have enough people. It's a slow time of year. Go for it. Get wow. a new perspective on life. Yeah, that's great. And, you and so we try to find those things, you know, just, yeah. and even if our support staff, we do a lot of internal education, a lot of training just to let people grow and develop. I think all of us, regardless of what industry, what we're doing, you know, there's three things that really motivate people and, you know, autonomy, having purpose uh, and having mastery. So we want to be good at what we do. We don't want to be micromanaged and we want to believe in what we're doing. And, and that last part, believing is easy in veterinary medicine because we're, we're taking care of animals. There's so much you said there. <laughs> this, this conversation is awesome. One of the things that you touched on and the way you, you ended your statement right there is so true. I mean, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, horse owners maybe forget the bigger picture and, you know, you can, like I see, every time I see a vet, I know they look tired, but everything you describe that you offer your vets, um, yes, I mean, they're looking after other people's animals. I think, isn't that, that's part of their increased stress. They're doing it because they love the animals. They're doing mm -hmm. it. So th there's almost like this personal investment involved. And like you said, in some cases, they're, they're that animals, that horses vet for years. I know I feel that way about my massage clients. And, and so, yes, I think that's something definitely that's added to the relationship and to that added stress and to everything that they carry home with them at the end of the day. Yeah. And I, more research is coming out in terms of, you know, why is it that this stress more than other professions? I don't want to sit there and like, oh my God, we're poor vets, but there is a cause and effect. Yeah. And when you start seeing this like substantially higher suicide, burnout, leaving the profession, right? There's something to it. There was a recent study from the American Veterinary Medical Association in the fall of 2021, where veterinarians were leaving their jobs twice the rate of human physicians and registered veterinary technicians were leaving their jobs at a higher rate than nurses. So there's, you know, and we know what's going on with people coming out of the pandemic. They talk about the great resignation, particularly in the United States. Yeah. It's affecting the veterinary profession at a higher rate than other wow. industries. Whew, that's a lot to, uh, I bet you weren't expecting yes. that in our conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I did ask the question, so yeah. I, but I knew you'd have, you'd have a lot of info there. Wow. All right. So did you always know this was the path you were going to walk going from farrier to vet to MBA? How different is it from what you had pictured when you first started? Oh, I am so not where I thought I was going to be. <laughs> when I was in high school, I was like the drama kid. And I went to Concordia University in communication studies. And I was part of that first cohort that was doing like, you know, accessible video making and computer animation and what have you. I went to a high school reunion, uh, 30th anniversary. Uh, and I think I was the biggest surprise because everybody remembered me in high school and they're like, you're a veterinarian, you're a horse <laughs> veterinarian. And I was just like, you can just see people looking at you just like, no, like, no. So, um, you know, and then I, you know, I had the, I, I grew up downtown Montreal. I was a city kid. Like I did, did not know horses, uh, but I had the good fortune of, of, of starting to take riding lessons and I fell in love with it. And, you know, I had somebody had bought me a 10 pack of lessons. And by the seventh, I signed myself up. And then within a year I had my own horse. And then at the time I was living in Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. When the farrier would show up, he'd come every three weeks on a route. And if, a horse pulled the shoe uh, the next day, you'd have to wait three weeks for him to come back again. So I was like, this is ridiculous. So I went to the Oklahoma Farrier School, at least to learn how to put shoes on or to take care of my own horse. And I fell in love with that. And so that's when I decided I'm going to pursue being a horseshoer. And I did that for about five years. But you know, as you know, I'm, I'm a tall guy. And mm -hmm. 
my back was killing me. I'm six, four. I'm, I'm too, I'm too tall and too wimpy to be a farrier. <laughs> honestly. <sighs> and, um, I was sort of looking at options and you know what it's like when you're having a farrier with a really good client because you're there so often and you, know, you talk about a lot of things. And so I was sharing with a very good client, my, my frustrations and my, yeah, just uncertainty what I wanted to do. And she's like, you should go to vet school. And it was the literal prov proverbial light bulb went off. And I was like, you're right. Uh, and it, it was, she was right because as a farrier, I had the good fortune of apprenticing with a, a farrier who became a vet in the United States. And all we did was work on lame horses. And I was so fascinated by lameness, but I was limited in my, my knowledge of, of a farrier. I, like, I didn't know the, the whole other body systems. I couldn't x-ray, I couldn't do nerve blocking, what have you. And so, yeah, and I, so I started doing all my undergrad courses. So I had never taken a science class bef ever before I got into my undergrad. And I remember like in a bio, my first biology midterm, I was like, so I used to do the arts and English and you can sort of BS your way through it. You know, you just, you know, talk about themes and it was all very gray. And I was like, there's, there is an, this is black and white. So it was a real mind shift in how I did things. And uh, yeah, and I was fortunate to get into OBC. Um, and uh, there I met my wife and then we started the practice. I knew we, I always wanted to have my own practice. Uh, I'm a horrible employee. Um, I'm just don't, I'm just a bad employee. And I, I knew what we wanted to do. She and I, Melissa and I had a vision of what we wanted the practice to be. And we thought, let's do it. The MBA, I don't know. I, I did my MBA when I turned 50. So that was my midlife crisis. Other people buy a Corvette and mistress. I decided to go get an MBA and that was a blast. I loved it. I loved it so much. Um, I graduated as a class valedictorian, which was a big honor for me. Um, I just realized at the age of 50, I mean, yeah, I don't have much more timeline to make dumb mistakes. So how do you get smarter? Uh, you can make mistakes when you're in your thirties, you have a lot of time to recover, but when you make mistakes in your fifties, you don't. And so, uh, and it opened up a whole new world for me. And I just, I just, love it. I'm just so glad I did that. That's awesome. And you know what, I didn't realize so your story about, you know, getting into sciences and all that kind of stuff. I was the exact same way when I took the, the massage therapy school, like the program of 2200 hours, you know, all that kind of stuff, full anatomy, full physiology, my science credit in university was the history of medicine. So mm. that should tell you where I was at. So I was in the exact same place when I got into the the equine massage therapy program, I was really nervous about all those sciences. But once I, I just dove into it, and I could connect it to the horse and a passion of things I really wanted to learn, I ended up graduating from there with the award of excellence. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. No, that's funny. That's awesome. I remember just remember reading I had my first uh, biology textbook and just reading it. I'm like, who knew this existed? I'm like, well, obviously, a lot of people they wrote a book on it. And I was just like, absolutely fascinated by it. Yeah. And I remember like, in a, and like organic chemistry. I loved it. Oh my God. <laughs> I loved it. I got an A plus on the final. And I remember like friends looking at me like, you have five heads. So I'm like, no, I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. I could stay home on a Friday night and not go out to the bars. Cause I wanted to study anatomy. Who, yeah. who knew? <laughs> there you go. I get it. I totally get it. All right. So you are passionate about promoting this industry outside of what it is that you do, as shown by all the volunteer work you do in support of the equine community. So yes, you are on the Ontario Equestrian Board of Directors. You are also on the um, Equestrian Canada Industry Development Committee as well. What kind of opportunities do you see for equestrian sports that show it as it's as it's as accessible, sorry, and a valued activity? You know, you have to give back. I mean, so many people open doors for me, uh, paved the path for me to not give back to me is a, is a great act of selfishness. Uh, we've all had mentors, we've all had supporters. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to do that. Um, you know, so why do I give back? Well, to do that, but I also, I, you know, I also think of the absolute joy, confidence, discovery, so many emotions in terms of when I first got involved in horses and that horse community, you know, it's an amazing community. 
And, you know, you want that to persist for other people. Um, it's the, the relationship between the rider and the horse. It's spectacular when it, when it all works well, it's spectacular. And why should, you know, I'm thinking, why shouldn't everybody have that opportunity? Uh, and, and, you know, so you look at that, um, you look at where we are in the greater Toronto area and you're like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of history about horses, but you also see this area changing so much. It's growing so fast. It's, you know, Toronto is the most ethically diverse city in the world. Um, it's this, it's really fantastic. And you can say that about a lot of the, the major centers in Canada. Um, and you're like, everybody should know about this. You know, really, that's what it should be. Everybody should know about this. That should not be considered a sport of elites or um, you, you've got to be phenomenally wealthy. It would help, but you don't have to be mm -hmm. uh, to enjoy it. And there's there's so so many levels. And it's not just hunter jumper or dressage. I mean, the, the Western world is, is, is growing. It's huge in the, in the States. Uh, just, you know, entry level classes and shows. I mean, just it's that community that it makes it so much fun. And, and I just let's everybody have, be, be part of that. Yeah. I hate to see this industry die out. Yeah. I mean, I've been on the receiving end of your mentorship and I've always appreciated that. And I can kind of see what you're talking about. Um, it's so funny because in some ways it feels like an elite sport. And I guess maybe depending on some of the circles and the clients I'm working on, and you, you could kind of get lost in that, but there's something coming back up. There's something bubbling. I, I yep. think there's, yep. and I think the pandemic did that. I think people are like, you know what? I want to do something new. I, I'm going to start taking riding lessons. And it's really yep. starting to grow. Yeah, I agree. And, and they get on a horse and then like me, it was like a city kid also. You're like, wow, who knew? <laughs> and then if they're hooked, they're hooked for life. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, and that's one of the things when I was interviewed for the, uh, the board of Ontario equestrian, and they did such a phenomenal uh, job interviewing people and selecting people. I was like, you know, we always look at equestrian as the three English disciplines, mm -hmm. but you know what, if you look in rural Ontario, rural Quebec, where I spent time, I've spent time in rural Alberta, there's a lot of other equestrian sports going along that are very accessible. Hmm. And you don't have to break the bank to buy a competitive horse. Yeah. So. so as a veterinarian on these boards, how do you find your knowledge and input most um, beneficial? Like, are, do people draw on you for certain points or is it just generally your experience and your philosophies and et cetera? Yeah, I think it's a general, I think the business background helps too, okay. uh, just in terms of driving stat, uh, strategy and board governance and how decisions are made. Um, you know, the medical knowledge, the veterinary knowledge is for sure helpful. Um, yeah, I don't know why people get selected on boards, but I, I just, I just, I think they see the success of the key panel and what we have done as something new that hasn't been done in, in this part of Canada. And they're like, let's get some of that input here, nice. you know this is a person that was able to with his team help build something that has not been done in our part of Ontario. Maybe some of that can, he can share that knowledge. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, Mike, how do you make all of this happen? <laughs> Sometimes people have a goal for their business dreams, but can never get them off the ground. So how have you been able to set yourself up for the successes you've had and the future ones you still strive for? Honestly, I mean, I mean, there was a, a clear vision from day one. So when Melissa and I started the practice, three things we wanted to do. One, have enough vets that they have quality of life. Two, um, be able to pour, pay our support staff a living wage. When we were students spending time at vet practices, uh, a lot of the support staff, if they didn't have a significant other that had a quote unquote real job, they were making poverty wages and I'm like for the education, the knowledge that they have, that's not right. And then the third um, was a lot of the veterinarians at that time didn't appreciate the human animal bond that horse people had with the horses. It was very much like, Oh, horse is just a commodity. And, you know, it's, you know, it's one of many who cares, but it's like, no, people want that connection. They want communication. They want to feel listened to. And, and so we had those three things are what drove us from the very beginning. Um, you know, I know a lot of people are like, why do they grow so fast? They just must be greedy. I was like, no, honestly, we just want to make sure we have a great place to work. Um, how do I make it happen? I'm also really curious. 
uh, love ideas. I read a ton still, and I'm always trying to think, you know, there's got to be a better way of doing this. There's always got to be a better way. And I think the real key is I surround myself with people that are much smarter and more skilled in other areas than I am. It takes a team. And so when you interact with the people that work with me, us at McKee Panel, I work with such amazing people. If it was just me, it no, it would not be happening. Wow. Not at all. So it, it's a team. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm with some really gifted people that makes it happen. I have great ideas. Uh, and I bounce them off them. We work together. They bring me great ideas. We, we bounce it off. It's a real collaboration um, and all striving for the same thing. Nice. Well, what's that old saying? Teamwork makes, no, teamwork makes the dream makes work. the dream work. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, you gotta, you gotta hire better. I am, you want to have, you don't want to be the smartest person at the table. You want to, you know, you want to be with great people that challenge you and make you better. Yeah. I, and I love learning too. Like yeah. I'm, I'm always open to sitting down with other people and, and, you know, just hashing out ideas and just getting excited about stuff. Yeah. And yeah. New ideas. So what is the typical day like for you? What about it? Would people be surprised to hear you say? My day is divided into reds and blues. So the reds are all my work that I do from a key panel. Huh. Blue is all the work I do with Oculus Insight. So on my calendar, I can look at it and it's a real mixture. Uh, I think, you know, every day is going to be some webinars or, or Zoom calls with people. With Oculus, I have clients in Australia and California, Middle East. Um, and so I'll probably spend one or two hours a day on a call with a client. Uh, I'll spend the rest of the day working at one of our clinics, working with our vets, um, spending time. We've, we've welcomed uh, a lot of new vets into our practice. So I want to make sure they get the culture of McKee Panel, how we take care of clients, how we take care of horses. horses. So I spend a lot of time with them. But I spend a lot of time planning, a lot of time planning and just trying to, you know, think what's going to happen. We're, we're coming out of the pandemic in Ontario, knock on wood. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, there's this horrible war going in on in Ukraine and gas prices and inflation. So every day is a challenge. And I feel a, a strong responsibility for the 54 people that work for us, wow. that they have a secure job that they can keep on growing and, and we'll, we'll take care of them. So that's what my day is like. Yeah. What's the best part about your job and what makes it the best part? I love getting compliments about our vets and staff and go. so yeah. that's that to me it makes my day so we have an internal slack channel where we have gold stars where we celebrate what people have done above and beyond or have gotten great news and i love when somebody shares oh i just got feedback from this person or that person um we, we you know we've gotten so many great new vets and you're always worried how are they going to integrate how are they going to get welcomed and i think our clients welcome our new vets very well um and when you get feedback or you get, you know, we send out uh, client surveys and people talk about, oh, so-and-so in the office was so nice and made me feel so uh, special. I'm like, that's my day made. Yeah. <laughs> so can you make sure that you enter my appreciation in, on your Slack channel? Yeah, <laughs> I will. Okay. <laughs> I will. Okay. Awesome. So after everything you've accomplished and the growth you've seen McKee Pownell experience, do you still look at horses the same way you did as when you were a farrier or a vet when you first started out? Like, I know for me, 20, almost going into my 24th year of massaging, you know, it's, I still get that connection the moment I lay my hands on a horse and, and I still enjoy the connections with the clients and stuff. But yeah, I mean, there. I don't know. It's funny. I can never look at a horse and just say, oh, that's such a pretty horse. No, my eyes go to the top line. My eyes go to the, you know, the muscling. See, how, how I'm the you... opposite. I, I'm starting with the farrier. I, I realized when I became a vet, I was, I have a foot fetish because I was like <laughs> forced myself to look above the fetlock and look right. at the whole horse. <laughs> and I don't, uh, practice clinically as much anymore. Uh, I've had some injuries from the, my farrier days. And, and so I still am around. I love uh, spending a day with one of our vets on the road, um, seeing the interaction with them and the horse owner, um, seeing uh, patients of ours come back from the brink 
or a problem and to do well. Uh, so what I do is different, but why I do it is still the same. And, and just seeing horses um, and the owners do more than they thought possible. I love that answer. That's great. And, and so when you travel around with one of your vets, is it, um, is it more of on a consulting? So consulting way, like th- where they want, you. Ah, let's just, input? let's just hang out. Let's just hang out and nice. let's just, and I want to learn from them. You know, we, we have, we've welcomed some vets from different countries, uh, over the last year. So we have a new vet from Germany, one from originally from Spain and three from Mexico, all outstanding vets. Uh, and I've learned so much from them. Uh, uh, the horsemanship, the way they look at horses, their approach to medicine. It's, we all do things a little differently. Mm -hmm. Uh, the end result's pretty similar. And so I just love looking at the world through their eyes. Now, as young vets, I like going there because I like to, you know, if they're in a jam or uh, there's an awkward situation with the client, you know, like you're doing a pre-purchase exam, there's so many potential conflicts or, or, or tense situations in there. So it, it's nice to be able to give some guidance on particular, particularly client communication, but it's also nice when they're, you know, um, they're sort of at a wall, they're in an impasse, you know, they're trying to block out a lame horse and like try this or try that. And it's, uh, that's gratifying. Yeah. yeah. I just, I get, I love seeing people develop. And so that's, you know, so going with spending time with our vets and their vet assistants and just seeing how people work. That, that's a blast. Ah, that's great. Yeah, I love that too. All right. So one of the qualities you listed in your bio for me was leadership. And part of being a strong leader means you need to be strong in self-leadership. Can you identify what goes into strong self-leadership and why it's so important? I think there are two uh, main factors. Number one is a sense of humility and with open ears, you've got to be listening, 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 uh, as you know, there's a great definition of leadership, the leadership doesn't answer the questions, the leadership sets it up so others can answer the question. And so you're creating an environment for others to, to do great things. A, a leader is about putting together a vision of where this business is going to go and to help others achieve it to be even better than they thought they can be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you, you know, you have to have that humility in the service of others. It's not like it's my way or, you, you know, the highway or follow me. It's like, no, it's, I'm going to help you be better at this. Um, and so with that comes a strong level. And this is always a work in progress of strong emotional intelligence, being aware of the impact you're going to have on others or how others impact you. Um, you talk to people that work with us in the late two thousands, I was not a nice guy. I, I made a lot of people cry. I, I don't like to admit it, but it's true. Um, because I am, um, at the time, much more impulsive, much more driven, not really sure of how other people, uh, should be. And, and, you know, one day you wake up and you're like, you know what, we spend the majority of our waking hours at work, um, it should not be a place of trauma for somebody when a big six foot four older gray haired guy starts freaking out. Like that's not a good place for anybody to be in. So let's be a little kinder. Let's understand what uh, pushes me to, to erupt like that. Mm. And so there's been a lot of learning, being aware, understanding what are my triggers, how they impact other people. And, you know, since I've made that shift and, and, and really reflected on my impact on others, um, you know, I'm not saying it's, it is who I am. So it's, it's moderated. It's kind of like the Hulk, you know, <laughs> uh, you never want to be in the position when the Hulk goes off. Um, but, uh, you know, it's sort of, um, as one associate said to me once when she came and spent time after being a student and uh, there's a situation where I could just see, she was like, he is going to erupt. And she was like, Oh my God, you're like Buddha now. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, really, life is too short. And on a, and that's a driving factor is we do spend the majority of our working hours together. And it should be a, a good place. And it should yeah. not be a drain. It should be rejuvenating. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of interviewing for because we're growing to add people to the office. And to me, it's one of the my, that's probably one of the 
positions of privilege that I never really appreciated so much until recently. You've got these young people that just finished university or finished college or finished working with a trainer or what have you. They're moving on to the next step. And you have a choice as a leader of you can open up doors for them, give them the confidence to take on the world, or you can totally scar them and screw them up yeah. and say, I don't want anything to do in this horse industry. To me, it's an easy solution, but you need to have discipline as that leader to recognize eh, I'm creeping over to the other side. Yeah. Well, Let's I mean, a little bit more genuine and kinder on the other side. As you described self-awareness or emotional intelligence, I mean, I guess, isn't that one of the benefits of getting over the 50 mark? Because then you realize, you know, you can kind of look back and then look forward and you say, okay, where do I want to be here? I know that with the life coaching that I've gotten involved in, I mean, I've always been a huge fan of personal development. I love growing, pushing myself, understanding the whys of what I do, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I can completely see that. And I think that sort of evolves into the, the self-leadership of recognizing when changes need to be made within ourselves. How can I become a better person and interact better with people and basically get more out of your life? Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and so you, you, and you hope that you're having that positive influence. So when people move on and people move on, that they realize this is how it can be. And, you know, I will in turn treat other people in a better way. So um, it's, it's a tough life out there. It's a, it's a tough profession. Uh, and so if there's a, an area where it could be a, a refuge and a place to recalibrate and to grow, um, to develop, why not? I mean, one of the things I have, I have the hardest time getting through to our new vets is you can make a mistake. You know, in veterinary medicine, mistakes can be terrible, but we learn from mistakes. What we don't want to do is repeat the mistakes. Um, but if you're going to make a mistake, own it, share it, we're all going to learn from it and we'll be better for it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, in the, in the aspect of self-leadership, it also is like looking after yourself and mm -hmm. recognizing, you know, when you need to take a time out and, and all that kind of stuff have, what's the most recent thing that you can say you've learned about yourself through this process, other than not turning into the Hulk. <laughs> uh, I need to have a certain level of physical activity. And so for the longest time, because of injuries from, you know, as a vet and as a farrier, I, I wasn't as active. And I will admit I was at a vet conference before the pandemic hit and I was at a hotel and they had a Peloton bike. And I said, I used to love riding a bike when I was a kid, but everything hurts, but I'm going to try getting on the bike. And I was just like, ah, oh, yes. So I try to ride about four or five times a week. And oh, what it would, even though this takes an extra hour in the day and you're like, well, we have so few hours as it is, it helps me focus. It helps clear my mind. And so I'm better for the other hours. Awesome. Yeah. So. That's all we can. It's, I mean, I've learned, I think I turned 50 last year and I think I've learned to really make myself a priority. I have to, I have to invest yeah. in that time and, and uh, it has definitely paid off. I'm, I'm feeling sort of getting back into the more physical health, mental health and, and booking time for me. Yeah. yeah. We have to, and I think in the horse industry, we have such a, oh, it's 24 seven, go, go, go. I was like, no, you know what? It's diminishing returns. If you're tired, your mind somewhere else, you're not effective. You're not as good as you think you are. Yeah. Step aside for a bit and regroup. Yeah. Awesome. Mike, this has been an amazing conversation. I really thank you for your, your transparency and the answers that you were able to, to give our listeners and open up some eyes and some ears and some hearts about what's going on in, in the world of, of equine veterinary science. So um, yeah, it's much appreciated. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. And it's, it's fun how life takes you because I remember when we first started working together years ago on common uh, cases. So it's, it's wonderful that you've taken this path too. So congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. You take care. You as well.